Uh, but I want to begin with a few preliminaries, which are very important to bear in mind as we begin to grapple with the unfolding message of scripture. I don't know if you play golf, I'm hopeless, but apparently it's very important to spend a considerable amount of time getting ready on the tee before actually hitting the ball. Um, and so it's worth spending a bit of time waggling a bit on the tee uh, before we launch in. And uh, so I've uh, got a few preliminaries. And the first is this, that the scripture is complex. That's the next slide. Uh, the Bible is made up of 66 books. Uh, it's actually a library. Uh, and it's by many, many different human authors written over 3,000 years and uh, in a number of different languages. So it's quite complex. And an overview uh, seems to me a bit like Google Earth. It's good to step back and get the overall picture, which is what Google Earth does. The second um, preliminary to stress is that Scripture is progressive. I suspect most of us have got sat navs in our cars these days, or we take them on our phones. And with that, our directions are spoken to us as we go along. The sat nav knows our destination and is trying to get us there, but it, it doesn't give it all at once. It says, turn left in 500 yards or do a U-turn uh, when possible. Well, um, it's good to think of the Bible as uh, a sat-nav. It knows where it's going. God knows where he wants to take us. The storyline moves on, though, to our eventual destination, starting in the beginning with creation uh, and then the unfolding story of God's purposes and and plans leading ultimately to the wonderful destination of a new heaven and a new earth uh, in Revelation. The third uh, preliminary uh, to mention is the old truth that needs to be underlined, which is the Bible is ancient. It's been around a long time. It was written uh, many years ago over a long period, uh, finished um, almost 2,000 years ago. So it is ancient. Thankfully, our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So there's no inconsistency, uh, but it is helpful to understand sometimes what we're looking for. And I've put up this slide as a uh, as an indication of that. That, if you don't know what it is, is part of an ordnance survey map, not so much used these days, but really helpful for hill walking in particular. Uh, and we need to know some um, of the uh, ingredients of the ordnance survey if it's going to make any sense to us. What on earth are all those brown lines and the blue lines and the numbers there, uh, we need uh, to understand a little bit about what is now a very old way of looking at a map. And that's the same as far as the Bible. We can't get away from the fact that it was written a long time ago. We have to keep that in mind. But the great thing is that the Bible has one supreme author, the Spirit of God. He is behind all the human authors. You can go on to that slide. Yeah, one supreme author. Well, whether the human authors were aware of it or not, God was in, in charge. And that's why all the different books 
complement each other and brought together by the supreme author, the spirit of, of God. They don't contradict each other. They give us different insights into God's purposes and plans. But there is one central character, and that is Jesus Christ. And fortunately, we live in the days when Jesus has come and lived and died, been raised to the life again and is ascended. And so we, as we read the whole Bible, right from the beginning, can look out for references to Jesus and see how he is central. All prophets, priests, um, and leaders in the Old Testament, for example, are to be compared and contrasted to Jesus. Uh, and so there's one main theme, uh, and that is God's plan for our salvation. And there are a number of ways of looking at that, but the way that I find really helpful as an ongoing theme throughout the Bible from beginning to end is to see in terms of uh, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is God's people in God's place, enjoying God's presence. Three Ps, easy to remember, that's what the kingdom is. God's people in God's place, enjoying God's presence. We can easily remember that. I might test you next week. There's one other thing that I want to um, say about the Bible, uh, which I think is really important, and that is it's good to see it, think of it, and read it as a love letter. Um, I have got a few of Andy's letters to me um, when we were going out together and living separately. Um, she was in Oxford, I was in London, and she, you know, it was in the days before internet and um, phones were expensive. Uh, and so we wrote to one another. Um, and uh, if I showed one of those letters to you, you would think, well, that, that looks very boring indeed, very old and dusty, and I can't, and the writing is in hardly legible, and uh, it doesn't mean much to me. But obviously to me, uh, it was very special. I still remember getting them and uh, picking them up and rushing off to the bathroom and locking away uh, myself away and reading, um, trying to understand absolutely every, looking for every nuance that she might be wanting to communicate to me. And you know, the Bible is God's love letter to you and to me. Uh, and we need to discover that. And it's quite a transition. You know, I remember my first reading of the Bible, as far as I know, was um, for uh, GCSE O level, as it used to be called. Uh, GCSE, as it now is. And uh, it was one and two kings. I I'd never been so bored in my life. In fact, I remember concluding that the Bible was the most boring book ever written. Um, but then Jesus found me and rescued me and brought me into relationship with him. And I discovered actually the Bible's the most exciting book ever because it's his love letter. It's his story, his expression of his love for me and his rescue, full of encouragement and promise. Yes, warnings and suggestions as well a life code, yes, but, but it's good to think of it as a love letter. Of course, um, not surprisingly, with such a collection of books, um, it's made up of many different kinds of writing. And different books appeal to different people. And so I wonder which is your favorite book in the whole Bible. We're going to break for a, a, a very short 
moment. Uh, and it would be just interesting in your small group to um, answer this question and share which is your favorite book. We'll have an opportunity. You have to accept your breakout room. So I'm going to give you them now. You just accept it and we'll, um, I'll bring you back in a three minutes, John. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Brilliant. Hi there, everybody. Um, I bet you were surprised by the variety of uh, different books that, that people chose, or maybe you were an unusual group where everybody liked the same one. But in my experience, and it'd be quite interesting if you um, wrote your favorite on, on the chat uh, channel, um, just to see the variety of books, different books that people people particularly uh, like. In my experience, often it's pretty evenly split, even between Old Testament uh, and New Testament. Uh, and the the truth is that that God knows that different people like different things. Isn't that amazing? But uh, what's um, yeah, it's coming up all sorts of different, you can see it. Proving my point, well done. You are a group of normal people. Um, now, the, the thing is that there are many different kinds of writing uh, in the Bible. History, poetry, prophecy, uh, letters, apocalyptic, um, uh, which we'll come on to, uh, 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 wisdom, various other worship songs but genesis um 1 to 11 is a genre of its own kind it's so important therefore to know what kind of uh, book that we're reading reading now there's there's been a, a lot of unnecessary argument about um the beginning of genesis um and how it's been presented often uh, is a, a battle between science and the Bible, uh, with heavyweight science in one corner, next slide, and um, lightweight Bible in the other side. Uh, and that's all as a result of Darwin uh, writing his Origin of Species, and so the debate has misfired. Um, so many claim sciences disprove Christianity. Others respond, no, you must accept Genesis literally. Now, I agree that Genesis 1 to 11 is important and if untrue, undermines Christianity um, because so much of the rest of the Bible depends on understanding and accepting its truths. However, I also want to say uh, that the whole science Bible debate is a complete red herring because it's based on a false assumption that those first 11 chapters are history as we understand it today. Genesis 1 to 11 is clearly not normal historical right, doesn't claim to be. Uh, immediately you leave the Tower of Babel in chapter 11, you read a very different kind of writing with Abraham in chapter 12 and it becomes history. So what is Genesis 1 to 11? It's what I call storytelling. Um, stories explain things. And Genesis 1 to 11 explains some big issues such as what God is like, why humans are special, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, these stories are based on historical fact, well, you know, very different from pretend stories like Sleeping Beauty and Snow White, who never existed, but Jesus and Adam and Samuel did exist. Adam's disobedience was disastrous. If Adam didn't exist, then much of what the Apostle Paul says makes no sense. 
Um, Kipling's just so stories are, are lovely stories, how the elephant got its trunk, <clears throat> how the camel got its hump and that sort of thing. Delightful stories, but not based on, on fact. <coughs> um, the Bible stories of Genesis 1 to 11 are based on fact. They explain things. They simplify, yes, um, but embellish the truths. So how are we to approach them? Well, I suggest that we enjoy them. Enjoy them for what they are. They have been used to inspire some of the greatest painters, musicians, and writers. Respect them. Respect them for the explanatory stories they are and have confidence in them because God chose them to explain truths. There's no need to defend them against science or to give up in despair. They explain deep truths. If God had wanted to use history, he could have done, but he chose this kind of storytelling as the best way to reveal deep truths. Um, I was going to give you breakout rooms again now, but I'm going to keep going because I've got an eye on the clock. Um, I wonder what you think uh, are some of the... Next slide, please. That's an example of some of the the wonderful things that Genesis 1 to 11 have created. Um, and then the next slide is um, asking you, you were going to go into groups for that, but I'm going to move on uh, to what I think are some of the deep truths that uh, Genesis 1 to 11 unpacks, which actually we see unfolding again and again throughout the Bible which is why it's so important to get to grips with them right at the beginning. The first great truth is that God made everything. He is the creator. He's separate from creation, but it belongs to him. How did he make everything? By his word. When he speaks and wills, things come into existence. We see that creation is good, and to be enjoyed. And that's good to remember. Food and sport and sex within marriage and, and wine and all sorts of other good things are there to be enjoyed. Science comes actually from a Christian worldview, from marveling at a, a world in order. We too marvel at the world. And we should care for God's creation. Evil was not made for him. We are made by him and therefore we are dependent on him. Um, so the second great truth is that human beings are the pinnacle of creation. That's what the story reveals. We are made like God from dust, yes, but with the image of God inside. So unlike the other animals, we mustn't kill each other. And that means murder and abortion are wrong. And notice we are plural, men and women, different but equal complementary, which is why marriage is between a man and a woman. And one other thing that the deep truth that the Bible reveals there is that, that we're made uh, to rule, to govern the world on God's behalf. So the third uh, deep truth that is um, embryonic here, right at the beginning, is the kingdom of God. The kingdom is introduced with God's people in God's place 
enjoying God's presence. It's not specifically referred to, but that's what the Garden of Eden is. God's people, Adam and Eve, um, in God's place, Eden, enjoying God's presence, his rest, enjoying holiday with God forever. And that's a good deep truth to remember. You are free. And just um, that's what Adam and Eve were told. You're free. Enjoy. Enjoy everything. There's just one rule. Don't eat of that tree. And it's worth just thinking, well, why are God's rules negative? Thou shalt not, even later. Well, actually, that's helpful. A few no's is much easier to cope with than an endless list of must-dos. No, there's one no in Eden. Don't eat that tree. Otherwise, enjoy everything. Well, that leads to the next um, deep truth, which Genesis 1.11 story tells us, and that is the seriousness of sin. The serpent, um, the devil, as uh, revealed in the New Testament, questions the existence of the word of God. You'll still hear his voice today. Did God really say? Are you sure that the Bible is the word of God? Of course, Eve uh, gets it wrong by making it stricter. Oh, God said we mustn't touch that tree. He never said that. Um, then the enemy questions the truth of God's word. You're not going to die. You don't really believe in hell, do you? And he's still saying that sort of thing. You won't die. Nothing will happen if you break a few small rules. And then he questions the purpose uh, of God's law. Experience disobedience, he says, and live a bit. Try a, a little naughtiness here and there. And our ancestors rebelled and disobeyed God. And they did what we would have done which is why they are our representatives. And as a result, they felt shame uh, and uh, they blame each other. It's her fault. Um, you gave it to me. It's your fault, God, says Adam. She blames the serpent. It's not my fault. It's his fault. Uh, and the result is they're excluded from the kingdom, from the garden. Um, showing just how serious uh, rebellion against God is, sin is. Um, sin is serious. And death is the sentence. And that's why we need a, a saviour. Um, the seriousness of rebellion, the rebellion against God, should, couldn't be made clearer. It ultimately led to the crucifixion of the perfect, innocent Son of God, utter darkness. And we need to, to grasp that truth. I wonder, have you really grasped how terrible your rebellion and sin against God is? Because you will never fully appreciate and wonder that the grace and goodness of God and his rescue plan until you see the darkness of sin and your rebellion. But just as we might be beginning to think, help, this is really hopeless, there is a glimmer of light. There are hints, even here, that God will not abandon his creation. The glimmer of light shines brightly in the darkness. And so we see one final deep truth that I want to mention, and that is the sovereignty of God. God is holy, and so sin must have its consequences. Uh, separation from God and ultimately death 
And yet, even as God banishes Adam and Eve, the Lord God himself made garments of, of skin for Adam and his wife. You know the story, I'm sure. God cannot stop caring for his creation. And there is another wonderful hint of what is to come when he tells the serpent that he will be bruised uh, by uh, the seed of the woman, a reference to Jesus who will be coming in due time and who will defeat Satan. Here is the first glimpse of the gospel. Um, God is not phased by our sin. He's a sovereign God. He's already planned for a rescue through one of the women's offspring, who we now know is Jesus, son of God, born of a woman, the second Adam, who through his once and for all sacrifice will rescue all who trust in him. But unfortunately, the next chapters get worse. Murder, Noah, uh, the flood, judgment, the great Tower of Babel expressing the power of man, and God has to step in. So there are some of the deep truths. Uh, I'm going to let you uh, break out again briefly um, because I want you to just share together uh, in uh, your groups, uh, which of those deep truths, if any, do you think are really important for you to grasp afresh uh, at this time? You see, the Bible is like soap. It needs to be applied. So the whole way through this overview will be saying, well, how, what difference does this make to me now in, in my life? These deep truths God underlined so that we could apply them to our lives. Um, just have a little chat together to see um, what you would particularly mention, and then we'll be back again uh, for the final uh, round. <laughs> Hi there, everybody. Welcome back. And um, I'm sorry to rush those times. It's just to get your mind thinking. Um, and we're up to Genesis 12. Well done. You're doing really well. I hope you're still with me. <laughs> okay. I'm enjoying myself. That's the trouble. Um, maybe you're thinking, help. I thought this was a Bible overview. And we've already uh, over three quarters of, through our first session, and we, we still haven't um, reached chapter 12 um, of the first book. So uh, maybe I've got the, the wrong idea. Well, no, you haven't. Um, the reason is twofold. First of all, grasping these preliminaries and these deep truths of the first chapters will help us so much in understanding the rest uh, of the Bible. Um, and the second truth to be encouraged by is we're, we're gonna start accelerating now. Uh, so hold on to your hats, make sure your seat belts are on and we're off. Genesis 12 um, uh, begins uh, history as we understand it and the promise to Abraham again, kingdom, isn't specifically mentioned to Abraham, but the, the, the promise is there from the beginning, the covenant, or a land, God's place, a nation, God's people, and God's presence with them. So uh, a key verse in understanding the story of Abram uh, is Genesis 15 and verse 6, Abram believed the Lord and he credited to him as righteousness. Abram was accepted by God, 
not because he was good, but because he trusted the promise of God. And that has always been the way of salvation, the pattern of the kingdom for sinful human beings. We can never deserve a place with God in his family. Our only hope is to trust the gospel. And the great news is that God keeps his promises. And so unlikely as it was, Abraham is blessed with a son. Uh, life and freedom, uh, the Bible unpacks, comes through sacrifice. And Abraham is willing to sacrifice his son. But God provides a substitute lamb instead. That's how God works. Gradually, the people of God multiply so that after Joseph, they have become very numerous. And in the story of, God, of Joseph, uh, to the, towards the end of Genesis, we see again the, dream, the deep, deep truth of God's sovereignty. Um, as Joseph says, to his brothers in the last chapter, Genesis 50 and verse 20, you planned this for evil, but God planned it for good to save many. God's sovereign hand at work, even using the sin of man, the mistakes of, of human beings to further his purposes. And we're into Exodus. Uh, that's 400 years later, and the people have multiplied, uh, but Joseph, after four centuries, is forgotten, and uh, Egypt and the Pharaoh have been got worried about how many Jews there are, uh, and they are in slavery. And so we come to the story of Exodus, their rescue by God. God hears his people's cry for deliverance, and he comes down to redeem his people, to rescue his people. And he chooses an individual, Moses, as the redeemer. Uh, to rescue God's people, a nation uh, who are again set free through sacrifice. Uh, God reveals his name in Exodus. You remember at the burning bush, uh, uh, Moses says, well, who, who shall I say sent me? Uh, and God reveals himself as I am. He is a God of relationship, um, and he is a present tense God. He wants to relate to us today. He wants to relate to you and me today. Um, we're set free, but not to do what we want, but for relationship. Despite Pharaoh's reluctance, God's people, uh, a nation, are eventually set free through sacrifice, the story of the Passover, the blood of the lamb sprinkled on the doorstep on the night of the Passover, a lovely picture of the shedding of blood of a future sacrifice, the lamb of God, Jesus, uh, and all those who trust in his blood uh, will not die, but be set free into eternal life. And so God brings his people out from slavery in Egypt and uh, into a covenant with his people. Covenant is another stepping stone on the pathway of the root of Salvation Covenant is a partnership with promises on both sides. And God promises to be committed 
to his people and he asks for a, an equal commitment from them. And at Mount Sinai, uh, later in Exodus, God gives his law, the Ten Commandments, uh, as we know them. Now, those Ten Commandments were never meant to be the means by which people get right with God. Um, the people are already God's people. He's already rescued them. He's already redeemed them through his grace. The law is to help them obey his way, his purposes. The response is trust. And that is still true. We'll never get right with God by trying to obey whatever laws we think he's made or we make up ourselves. God has rescued us through Jesus if we trust him, but our response is to want to obey him. Um, and one result of trust and obedience is the presence of God. The presence in the Old Testament is experienced firstly in the tabernacle. And uh, God lived with his people. Uh, and Leviticus, the next book in the Bible, is full of uh, stories and uh, descriptions of sacrifices and ceremonies um, leading to the climax, the Day of Atonement, when uh, the sins of the people are laid on um, um, the two goats brought, one is sacrificed, the sins are laid in the other, and he's sent out uh, into the desert, taking sin away. Another wonderful picture of Jesus here in the, in the, in the Old, Old Testament. Um, Jesus, uh, the one who was sacrificed for us, for whom the sin of the whole world was laid, who by his sacrifice by his blood, takes away uh, our, our sin. Um, it's worth remembering in Leviticus, though, that for all the emphasis uh, on uh, sacrifice, um, it's also a number of instructions about great feasts, including the Passover, Feast of First Fruits, Feast of Weeks, later known as Pentecost, and of course the Day of Atonement. God loves a feast. God loves a party. Uh, and we tend to, to miss out on those. Uh, then we come to the book of Numbers. Um, and Numbers, I'm afraid, is all about disobedience and delay. Uh, typified by the rebellion at Korah. If you remember the story, um, Joshua and Caleb are the two spies who are sent out by Moses to spy out the promised land. And they come back full of good report. Yeah, God is, God's right. It is a wonderful place that he's promised us, flowing with milk and honey. And, and we can take it. Um, yeah, there's, there's enemy theirs, but we can take it. But the people are terrified, uh, and they start moaning. <laughs> um, the people of God say, uh, well, we'd be better off back in Egypt. Uh, and, of course, that brings judgment from God and underlines the seriousness of sin again. You know, we can't trifle with rebelling against God. And all that generation, except Joshua and Caleb, who trusted God, will die before reaching the promised land. Instead, they spend years wandering in the wilderness. Although even there, God provides for them, despite their complaining, giving them manna to eat. So Numbers gives us a, a serious warning. God is faithful 
to his promises. But he will still let his people walk away from him and them if they insist on doing so and must face the consequences. The next book is Deuteronomy. Uh, and this brings us to the very brink of the promised land. Uh, at the start uh, of Deuteronomy, um, Moses explains the Torah, the law, and gives them the key, which is still key to the Jewish people today, the Shema, Deuteronomy 6 and verses 4 and 5. Let me read them to you. You, I'm sure, will know them. The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. An Orthodox Jew says that every day. And uh, it summarizes everything uh, about the law. Uh, it's, it's to love God with all that we are. That's the key. And by the last chapters uh, of Deuteronomy, Moses is, is near his death. He's not um, allowed to go into um, the promised land himself because he himself had been disobedient. Uh, but he sets out the choice for the people. Choose this day whom you will serve. And he lists the blessings from choosing to serve God and the curses are also spelt out uh, if you disobey God. And we're into Joshua. Um, I love Joshua. Um, mind you, I love Genesis too. Anyway, um, Joshua uh, is uh, another, like Moses, like Abraham, uh, uh, a picture of Jesus in some ways to be compared and contrasted. Um, Moses has died and Joshua is the new leader. Um, and um, he's scared. <laughs> he's scared, not surprisingly, of going across the Jordan. His, his great mentor has just died. Uh, he's got to go and take the land. And he's got to take the responsibility. Um, and he's really not sure he's up to it. And right at the beginning of Joshua, um, uh, God meets with him and says these wonderful words. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Wonderful, wonderful promise. And in fact, what God is saying uh, is don't be afraid, stay in my word and move in my spirit. Um, and those are the twin tracks of faith throughout the Bible for the kingdom of God, word and spirit. And wherever the church, the people of God, have become derailed from one or the other, they've, got, they've, they've gone off uh, into trouble. Um, if you let go of the word and just float away with um, enjoying experience of God, you're, you're in serious trouble. But likewise, if you just stick uh, with a word and uh, stop enjoying relationship with God by his spirit, the present day relationship that the spirit longs to give us, promises to give us, then you dry up. Um, all word and no spirit, you dry up. All spirit and no word, you blow up. Word and spirit together, and you will grow up. And that's here in the Old Testament, uh, in these early books of the Bible. Joshua trusts God, and he leads the people into the promised land and gradually conquers it. Now, in the old days, some people used to think 
you know, crossing the Jordan was like death, crossing Canaan, entering the promised land of heaven. Uh, but it's not that, it's, it's because there's still battles to fight um, in this promised land. Uh, now, this is the Christian life. This is the Old Testament picture of, of living God's, God's life. Um, yes, it takes faith and trust to step out and cross the Jordan. It's not until the priests walk up to the river that the river parts. And it's the same for us. We have to step out in faith. But as we do that, God provides and opens up the way. And the promised land that he's promised is ours. And he will be with us by his spirit. Um, but we have to step out. Uh, and there's still battles to fight. Um, the Christian life is not trouble-free, as I'm sure we're all only too ready and able to testify. It's full of, of, of troubles, and difficulties, and temptations. And um, sin is still to be ruthlessly expunged. That's why Joshua deals so severely with some of the sinful people and things because sin is serious and and it's still true sin is serious we can't flirt with it we can't play with it we can't serve two two masters um but we can be assured of ultimate victory now there are still huge battles to fight and temptations to resist um but but god is with us and so with the end of joshua we are on the brink of the kingdom being partially uh, fulfilled. We've seen in embryo the, the kingdom um, revealed, um, uh, spelt out, uh, as, as it were. Um, but we're going to go on to see the, the kingdom ruled. God's place, the promised land. God's people are the conquerors, and God's presence is promised to all of them who, who are committed to serve him. And so in the last chapter of Joshua, Joshua 24, Joshua outlines that continuing choice. Serve God or other gods. Choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And that is still the choice that we face. Will, which will we choose? Which will the people of Israel choose? Well, well, we'll see some of that next week as we continue in uh, the history section, uh, particularly of the Old Testament uh, and um, the kingdom actually coming into being gradually.